Alright guys, today's video is on high yield cancer syndromes. This is my 8th time recording this video, so hopefully this one turns out because I don't want to edit. So the ones I'll be talking about are on the left hand side of the screen. I tried to organize them by um, organ system, but obviously with inherited cancer syndromes they tend to affect more than one system. So I just did uh, what was logical. Uh, I won't be talking about any of the syndromes that aren't in this list. So uh, these are kind of the most high yield ones that I've seen. All right, so um, just starting off, I'm going to talk about uh, syndrome with colon cancer. So uh, what, what would you be thinking about if I told you a patient had hundreds or thousands of, of polyps on colonoscopy and they were at like age 11? Yeah, so you should be thinking about uh, FAP, familial adenomatous uh, polyposis. So uh, like I said, um, a lot of poly adenomatous polyps uh, on colonoscopy. And, and what part of the GI tract does this syndrome usually affect. You should be thinking that it's the rectum. Um, and one good way to remember that is uh, remembering the treatment we do for this. So what treatment do we do for FAP? What, what's the prevention and uh, surgery that we do for these patients? So usually starting of age uh, 10 to 12, we'll start doing colonoscopy. And then once these patients uh, complete puberty um, uh, or develop signs of uh, cancer, that we do a prophylactic uh, proctocolectomy. So proctocolectomy is removal of the rectum. So that's the procto and the colon colectomy. Um, without surgery, basically 100% of these patients develop colon cancer. Uh, the boards like to go after a couple unique uh, subsets of FAP as well. So what if I told you a patient with FAP had osteomas and fibromatosis and some dental involvement as well? Yeah, you should be saying Gardner syndrome for this one. And then, what if I told you a patient with FAP had um, some imaging suggestive of um, some brain involvement or brain cancer, like medulloblastoma or glioblastoma? Yeah, you should be saying Turcotte syndrome. And the good way to remember this second one, Turcotte syndrome, is that, um, let me pull up a pen, is that with Turcotte syndrome, uh, you wear a turban on your head, and that's where... Uh, brain cancer is. Um, so next I just have um, just kind of gen genetics so it affects the APC gene and the way I always remember this is that it's the APC gene and it's FAP. Alright and as you can see here uh, just by uh, gross imaging you can see um, just tons innumerable number of polyps so the next syndrome I'll talk about is, um, so imagine you have a patient that comes in with uh, signs of fatigue and you do physical exam and you see um, like four or five pigmented macules around the lips and they have some on their palms of their hands too. What would you be thinking about? Yeah, you should be thinking about Pussy-Jaeger uh, syndrome. And the way I always remember this is uh, from Attack on Titan, Aaron Yeager. That's the way I kind of remember it. And like I said, hamartomas in the GI tract and then pigmented macules, lips, mouth, uh, face, and hands. And this, has a inc this presents with an increased risk of colon cancer, pancreatic cancer, stomach cancer. So these are all GI cancers and uh, breast cancer as well. Um, but the most common presentation that I've seen is um, is bleeding and that's because of the hamartomas in the GI tract. Uh, just as a reminder, hamartomas are just um, basically disordered growth of tissue that's uh, normally supposed to be there. So, um, And then this is a mutation in the STK11 gene and it's autosomal dominant like most of the disorders that we'll be talking about um, today. And here's just an image where you can see the uh, pigmented macules on the lips. Um, so an important disorder to uh, be able to distinguish from Putz-Jaeger is uh, osler um, weber rendell syndrome, or HHT. And HHT is basically uh, a disorder of thin blood vessels. So uh, what kind of things does HHT present with? So you should be saying HHT presents with uh, like recurrent epistaxis that's difficult to manage, so that's nosebleeds, and also uh, can present with GI bleeding. Um, and you can also present with 
uh, erythrocytosis, and that's because of AV shunting in the lungs. So remember mostly with HHT that you get um, blanchable papules on the lips, and that's because of um, blood vessel malformation of the lips, and then you'll get AV malformations uh, in the nose and GI tract. And then another important disorder to distinguish from pooch jaeger syndrome is uh, familiar juvenile polyposis coli. And this will basically present with hamartomas in the GI tract in childhood, but you won't see the pigmented macules. All right, so moving on. So what if I gave you a patient and they have, um, let's say they're presenting now with fatigue over the last few months and uh, they have mucosal pallor on physical exam. And then when you ask family history, they said that they had a strong family history of female reproductive cancers like endometrial and ovarian cancer. What would you be thinking about? So you should be thinking about Lynch syndrome. So I basically just gave you a patient with, that presented with new iron deficiency anemia and a history, a family history of female reproductive uh, cancer. So this will present with uh, early onset colon cancer without polyposis, and it's due to microsatellite uh, instability. Uh, and the acronym for Lynch syndrome is CEO, and that's colon endometrial and ovarian cancer. And the way you can remember that is Merrill Lynch is like a, a banking company, so they have a big, powerful CEO. So I just remember the Merrill Lynch CEO. All right, and treatment of uh, Lynch syndrome typically involves uh, routine colonoscopy, but uh, unlike with FAP, we don't typically do prophylactic colectomy. And I usually remember that because Lynch syndrome doesn't present with the polyps. So uh, we don't uh, typically do the colectomy. All right. And this is a mutation in the DNA mismatch repair genes. And those are MSH2 and MLH1. And I usually remember that because I remember the M and it's mismatch. All right, so I just want to go over some general colon cancer risks now. So in general, some risks are uh, age, um, with adenomatous polyps, villus polyps have a higher uh, risk of colon cancer than tubular polyps. Also family history of colon cancer. And then the boards like to go after this one is that in inflammatory bowel disease, ulcerative colitis has a higher risk than Crohn's for colon cancer. So in ulcerative colitis, we usually start screening patients eight years after initial diagnosis and then every year following that. So that's AQ one years um, for screening for colon cancer. And then diet can play an impact as well. So some lab findings you can see in patients with colon cancer are an iron deficiency anemia. So that'll be a microcytic anemia, MC. Uh, v less than 80 and then uh, uh, you can see a elevated CEA but typically this isn't used for screening in colon cancer and then positive fecal occult blood test and this just uh, tests for blood in the stool the gold standard for diagnosis is colonoscopy with biopsy and then for treatment we typically will resect and scope all right so here we have some histology and as I mentioned the villus adenoma has a higher likelihood of a transformation to carcinoma than tubular adenoma. And then can anyone remind me of the uh, acronym for the syndrome for Lynch syndrome? Uh, what organs it affects? Yeah, you should be saying CEO. And again, that's the Merrill Lynch CEO. All right, good. Next, I just want to touch on the adenoma carcinoma sequence. So the adenoma carcinoma sequence is kind of a general sequence of how we get from normal GI epithelium into cancer. So notably Lynch syndrome doesn't go through this sequence. It goes through the, um, it's due to mismatch repair and microsatellite instability. So the adenoma carcinoma sequence is a good acronym. It's called AK53. That will basically get us from normal epithelium and then we'll get to basically to cancer and in between we'll have two areas so the first mutation that occurs in normal epithelium is APC gene knockout and can anyone remind me what syndrome causes APC gene uh, knockout 
hereditary. Yeah, you should be saying FAP. And remember, that's FAP for APC. Okay, good. And this is a tumor suppressor gene. So if you lose this, then uh, basically the tissue can proliferate more than normal. So basically we have abnormal hyperproliferating tissue. And the next one then is a CRAS mutation, K KRAS. And you may remember the RAS gene. So this is KRAS. Um, and this will lead to the formation of adenoma. And then after you have formation of adenoma, you get P53 mutation. And does anyone know the syndrome that causes that is caused by uh, hereditary knockout of P53? Yeah, you should be saying Lee-Fromani syndrome, and we'll talk cover that in a second. And then you have development to cancer. All right. So next we'll talk about some endocrine syndrome. So what if I gave you a patient that had uh, some st signs of stones, groans, overtones? So that will be your um, kidney stones, abdominal pain, and mental status change. And they also presented with like recurrent uh, ulcers that were refractory to proton pump inhibitor. And they've also been having trouble driving because they can't see out of the sides uh, of their vision. What would you be thinking about then? Yeah, you should be thinking about uh, MEN1 or multiple endocrine neoplasia 1. And does anyone know the acronym for MEN1? Yeah, you should be thinking about the three P's. So that's parathyroid, pituitary, and pancreatic. And this describes the organ involvement of MEN1. So for parathyroid, you basically present with hypercalcemia because of adenoma or hyperplasia. With pituitary, you can get a prolactinoma, so you can get uh, in, in women galactorrhea and males uh, infertility and then also by temporal hemianopsia so you can't see all the temporal parts of your vision and then examiners really like to go after the pancreatic manifestation so that's gastronoma or uh, that causes zollinger ellison syndrome um, El zollinger ellison syndrome and what that presents with is recurrent duodenal and stomach ulcers that don't respond to ppi so like omeprazole and You'll also see a positive secretin stimulation test. And then also VIPomas and uh, WDHA syndrome is also what VIPomas are called, are called, and that's watery diarrhea, uh, hypo, uh, kalemia, and achloridia. And this is a mutation in the ME1, uh, MEN1 gene. Um, and uh, like the other disorders we talked about, it's autosomal dominant. All right, and then there's also MEN2. Um, so the way I distinguish MEN1 and MEN2 is that MEN2 has an increased risk for medullary thyroid cancer instead of parathyroid involvement and then pheochromocytoma. Uh, and MEN1 doesn't have either of those. And this is a mutation in which gene? Good, you should be saying the RET gene, RET. Good, and RET gene is also uh, pretty common in medullary thyroid cancers. So... Uh, MEN2A presents with medullary thyroid cancer, pheo, chromocytoma, and then parathyroid hyperplasia. And can anyone remind me of the clinical symptoms of a pheochromocytoma? Yeah, you should be saying, uh, so intermittent flushing, hypertension, and headaches. And then you also see uh, hypocalcemia in medullary thyroid cancer because of, uh, of calcitonin uh, production, which as you remember, it tones down calcium, but you can also see hypercalcemia because of parathyroid hyperplasia. Uh, MEN2B presents with medullary thyroid cancer, pheochromocytoma, but presents with a marfanoid habitus. Can anyone remind me of what uh, uh, what disorder in biochemistry presents with marfanoid habitus? Yeah, you should be saying uh, homocysteinuria. All right, and this is my guy from airplane, and you can see the uh, sweating, flushing, and probably has a headache right now. Um, and that's kind of signs of pheochromocytoma, which you see in MEN2. And then here you have uh, signs of hypocalcemia when you get the twitching when you tap on the facial muscles. And that you can see that with medullary thyroid cancer because of calcitonin production. Good. Uh, now into renal. If I gave you a patient that had... Um, Let's say you, they, you saw an abdominal CT that they have 
bilateral kidney masses and they've had hematuria, uh, painless hematuria for the last several weeks. And then they've, they've also had ataxia. Uh, and you see on um, MRI, the brain, some um, um, uh, enhancing lesions or, uh, or hyperdense lesions of the um, cerebellum. What would you be thinking about? Yeah, you should be saying von Hippel Lindau. Um, and essentially, I think of this as a disease of excessive angiogenesis, and we'll get there in a we'll explain why in a second. But the clinical constellation of symptoms is hemangioblastoma in the cerebellum and retina, angiomatosis, bilateral renal cell carcinomas, and pheochromocytoma. And the reason that I, it, I think of this disorder as excessive angiogenesis is because it's a mutation in the VHL gene that causes uninhibited HIF1 alpha. And uh, n so normally when your body uh, has hypoxia, you induce HIF1 alpha. HIF1 alpha with uh, hypoxia. Because HIF1 alpha is hypoxia inducible factor, okay? And if you think about it, if you're basically in VHL, you get constitutively activated HIF1 alpha, which will stimulate your body to um, produce new blood vessels and keep forming uh, blood vessels. And because of that, you'll get formation of blood vessels in the cerebellum and retina, so hemangioblastomas, angiomatosis, and then the VHL gene is associated with renal cell carcinoma. And the way to remember that it's on chromosome 3P is that VHL equals three letters. All right, so here's an MRI, and you can see hemangioblastoma. And usually this will present with uh, like signs of ataxia or cerebellar signs. And then you also see bilateral renal cell carcinoma. All right, the next syndrome I want to talk about is Wilms tumor. So this is a type of tumor that presents in early childhood, and it's a tumor from glomerular cells. And this is a mutation of uh, WT1 and WT2 genes on chromosome 11. And the way to remember that is it's WT1. And I remember that the T kind of looks like a 1. So 11. All right. So the boards really like to go after a couple of specific disorders with Wilm tumor. So what if I told you a patient had Wager syndrome, W-A-G-R syndrome? Uh, what would the clinical constellation look like there? Yeah, that would be a, a patient with Wilms tumor, tumor and iridia with just absence of the iris, uh, GU malformations, and then intellectual disability. That's a mutation of the WT1 gene. What if a patient had Wilms tumor and dysgenesis of gonads? Yeah, you should be saying Denny's Drash syndrome. And then what if a pa you saw a patient with hypoglycemia, Wilms tumor, uh, in la enlarged tongue, and half of the body is... Um, larger than the other half. What would you be thinking about? Yeah, you should be thinking about Beckwith, uh, Beckwith, Beckwith Wiedemann. So what, uh, what uh, that is, is uh, Wilms tumor with hemihypertrophy. And that's when half of the body is kind of larger than the other half. And you can also get macroglossia or large tongue. And the way I remember that is you see width. So I think of Beckwith Wiedemann. So wide. All right, and that can help you remember the hemihypertrophy. All right, and this is a CT of a uh, Wilms tumor. Good. Now on to uh, breast syndrome. So uh, what if I gave you a patient with um, breast cancer and uh, I told you that the defect was with uh, double-strand DNA breaks and they were unable to complete homologous recombination? Uh, what gene would be knocked out? Yeah, that would be the BRCA1 and 2 genes. But, so this can present with breast, uh, ovarian, and pancreatic cancer. Also autosomal dominant. And as a failure of, uh, you're unable to complete a homologous recombination. So treatment for BRCA is uh, genetic counseling. And then uh, you typically want to consider uh, mastectomy and uh, removal of the fallopian tubes and bilateral ovaries after childbirth. And then in these patients, you typically screen with transvaginal ultrasound and CA-125. And what does CA-125 look for? That's right, you're looking for ovarian tumors. This image just shows that 
Baraka is important in double standard pair. All right. Next is, uh, what if I gave you a patient with uh, loss of P53 uh, when you do genetic testing? What would you be thinking about? And we've mentioned this earlier. Yeah, that's Lee Farmani syndrome. So that's a loss of P53. And the clinical constellation is SBLA syndrome. So that's sarcoma, breast cancer, leukemia, and adrenal cell cancer. And can anyone remind me where P53 normally acts in the cell cycle? That's right. It's normally at the G1S transition. What other protein uh, acts at the G1S transition? Yeah, you should be saying, so here's G1S, and this is a checkpoint, right? So P53 acts here, but also retinoblastoma. All right. All right. So what if I gave you a patient that had... Um, Multiple skin findings. So you saw nodules um, all over the back that are uh, kind of protruding. You saw cafe au lait spots. And then you do an optho exam and you see um, kind of uh, some discoloration in the eye. What would you be thinking about? Yeah, you should be thinking of neurofibromatosis type 1. So this will present with neurofibromas uh, that are cutaneous so on the skin. Uh, meningioma, cafe au lait spots, lish nodules, and also bone involvement, so like scoliosis. Uh, it can also present with pheochromocytoma. And uh, this is a mutation in the NF1 gene, which is a suppressor gene. That's on chromosome 17. And the way I remember that is that NF1, I just flip the 1 and the F. So I get 1 F. So NF1 into chromosome 17. All right, so these are what uh, cutaneous neurofibromas look like, and here are cafe au lait spots, but basically cafe au lait spots are kind of pigmented um, patches on the skin, and then Lish nodules here are actually hamartomas uh, of the irises. All right, so now with, uh, what if I gave you a patient that had uh, bilateral schwannomas and also uh, multiple meningiomas. What would you be thinking about? And I kind of gave it away by pressing too early, but it's uh, neurofibromatosis type 2, which is a mutation in the NF2 gene. And this can also present with some skin findings, but they're less common. And if you remember, a schwannoma typically affects um, the cerebellopontine angle. So that should say um, cranial nerve 7, 7, and eight, and you typically want to diagnose with this MRI. All right, and this is a mutation in NF2 and chromosome 22, and I just remember that with NF2, and this is two letters, so it's 22. All right, and here MRI, so you can see schwannoma at the cerebellopontine angle here, and what cranial nerves does that affect? That's right, seven and eight, so that can cause hearing loss, and then. Uh, you can see meningiomas. So those will typically be ring enhancing. And what can you see on histology? That's right, you can see some MoMA bodies. All right, good. Um, so I'm almost done. Just a few more to talk about. What if you're doing a newborn exam when you do your pediatrics rotation and that you see a patient that has uh, an absence of the red reflex? They have leukochoria, which is a white reflex. Yeah, you should be thinking about retinoblastoma. So that presents with a white reflex, and this is why I would do the uh, red reflex testing uh, in the newborn exam. So if uh, a patient has uh, leukochoria on both eyes, then you want to think about hereditary retinoblastoma. If it's only on one side, then it's likely sporadic. These patients also have increased risk for osteosarcoma, and it's a mutation in the retinoblastoma gene. And like we mentioned, it normally uh, is a checkpoint inhibitor at the G1S transition. So here's uh, what leukochoria looks like. Normally, uh, infants will have a red reflex. So when you shine a light, it, sh it should reflect red back. And then what if I gave you a patient that had uh, angiofibromas on the face and then hypopigmented patches over the skin? And then they have some leathery and thickened patches as well in the skin. And they're coming in for a seizure. 
Yeah, you should be thinking about tuberous sclerosis. And the way I typically characterize this di uh, disease is that there, you basically get hamartomas everywhere. And it's a mutation um, in the TSC1 and TSC2 gene. So it often initially presents with seizures, and that's because you get uh, basically hamartomas in the ventricles. They're called subependable uh, nodules. You also get angiofibromas, ash leaf spots, raptomyoma, angiomyolipoma, and shagreen patches, and these are basically all um, hamartomas as well. So mutation TSC1, TSC2, and that's the proteins hamartin and tuberin. It's autosomal dominant as well. So here we have angiofibromas, and then here's our ash leaf spot, so it's a hypopigmented patch. And then rhabdomyomas, you can see in the heart. And that's just, uh, again, hamartomas of uh, normal cardiac muscle that's disordered. All right, so the last one I want to talk about is just uh, skin. So what if I gave you a patient that basically is unable to tolerate sunlight? They've got freckling over the cheeks. And every time they go out, they get this sunburn that takes a long time to heal. <laughs> yeah, you should be thinking about XP or xeroderma pigmentosum. And uh, basically, they have uh, extreme sensitivity to sunlight, and it puts them at higher risk for skin cancer. And does anyone know uh, the genetic defect that causes this? Yeah, you should be saying nucleotide excision repair deficit. So they're unable to repair, like, your thymidine dimers, which occur with UV exposure. And does anyone know if UV exposure is radi uh, ionizing or non-ionizing radiation? Yeah, that's right. It's non-ionizing radiation. And this is the only one that we've talked about that's autosomal recessive. All right, so this is a patient uh, with XP, um, and you can see the freckling here. Um, and then um, there's actually something called camp sundown for patients with XP. And um, this is when, uh, so these patients can't go out in the sunlight due to their um, extreme sensitivity to the sun, so they have the camp with all the activities at night all right so here's a review slide so take a look at it um, and let me know if you have any questions all right thank you